vitamin D3 to children and demonstrated that they were equally as effective in maintaining vitamin D status. So at least in my opinion, if given in these what we consider to be physiologic doses of a couple of thousand units of vitamin D a day, that vitamin D2 is equally as effective as vitamin D3. And so for vegans, they don't need to worry. They can definitely take vitamin D2. For those in the supermarket that see mushrooms that contain vitamin D, it's perfectly a good source of vitamin D to supplement your requirements. What about the people who say, look, I could go out into the sun and in a half an hour to an hour, I could have 20,000 units of vitamin D come into my body through sunlight. So the thinking at that point is, look, the body is enabled by its nature to handle a high dose of vitamin D. Um, what do you say to that? Oh, that's very true. I mean, we, I, I typically treat my patients with um, the pharmaceutical form of vitamin D. It's 50,000 units. And I give them 50,000 units of vitamin D once a week for eight weeks to fill up the empty vitamin D tank. And that's equivalent to taking 6,000 units a day. And then to prevent them from having recurring vitamin D deficiency, I put them on 50,000 units once every two weeks forever. We published a paper recently in a medical journal demonstrating that after six years in this program, all of my patients are perfectly fine and their blood levels are in the range of 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, which is where we like them to be. Where are your blood levels? My blood, 54. It was just done a week ago. What do you do for yourself? And so I personally take a 2,000 unit vitamin D supplement and uh, I drink about three glasses of skim milk a day and take a multivitamin that contains now 1,000 units. So I'm getting somewhere in a range of about 3,000 to 3,500 units of vitamin D a day. And I take it every day. And the reason I do that is because if you get in a routine, you won't forget. Whereas if you think, oh, well, in the summertime, I'm getting sun exposure, and so I don't need to take it, it's probably true. But you can't easily judge how much sun exposure you have, how much surface area you've exposed. So it's true. Under ideal circumstances, if you are in a tanning bed, which mimics sunlight, and you get what's called a minimal erythemal dose, a light pinkness to your skin 24 hours later, whole body with a bathing suit on. For a young adult, it's equivalent to ingesting 20,000 units of vitamin D. And so, yes, you're right. If you expose your arms and legs, abdomen and back, you could probably make about three to 5,000 units of vitamin D. But like I said, you never, ever want to get a sunburn that's what increases your risk for the deadly skin cancer melanoma. And you want to get some sensible sun exposure, as I outline in the vitamin D solution. Do I understand this right, that a lot of the people who get melanoma are people that don't have an optimal range of vitamin D in their body and are not getting sensible sun exposure? In other words, they're out of the sun too much. It's well documented, and it's very interesting and curious, that most melanomas occur on the least sun-exposed areas, and occupational sun exposure decreases your risk for melanoma. We know that having a number of sunburning experiences as a child and young adult, being redheaded, having a large number of moles, and bad genetics, having a history, family history of having melanoma, are the major risks for developing melanoma. And so sensible sun exposure protects you from melanoma, Sensible sun exposure makes sure that your vitamin D status is in a healthy range. And whether or not the two are related, research is still underway to be able to determine whether that's true. You also said that people could cut down their degree of risk of diseases like prostate, breast, and colon cancer if they had enough vitamin D in their bodies and that it would cut the disease rate by 30 to 50 percent. That's huge. Yeah, I mean, the studies um, that were done by the Garland brothers and, and uh, William Grant uh, over the past decade and a half have been continuing to show that if you live at higher latitudes, so you're more prone to vitamin D deficiency, that you have as much as a 30 to 50% higher risk of developing colorectal cancer, breast cancer, um, and prostate cancer. Also, study done out of 
the uh, Nurses Health Study out of Harvard showed nurses that had the highest blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D, on average 48 nanograms per ml, reduced their risk of getting breast cancer by as much as 50%. Also, the Women's Health Initiative, it was found that those women who were most vitamin D deficient and followed for eight years on an insufficient amount of vitamin D had a 253% higher risk of developing colorectal cancer than women who started out at a higher blood level of 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So there is continued evidence to suggest that improving your vitamin D status can reduce your risk of some of these more deadly cancers, including breast cancer and colon cancer. How often do you test yourself? Well, I test myself only because people like you are constantly asking me to do so. (laughs) But the endocrine practice guidelines, and and I was the chair of this, and, and I agree with this, is that you don't really need to test. It's, it's expensive. In fact, what you really want to do is to increase your vitamin D intake. If you're normal weight, right, and you have none of the risk factors, you know, such as obesity and taking, say, prednisone or taking anti-seizure medications or um, you're African-American, right, you can take an adult two to 3,000 units a day. And if you don't have a malabsorption problem, you can raise your blood levels perfectly fine. You can feel confident that they're going to be perfectly fine. But those that are obese, pregnant, on these medications we've talked about, yes, you need to be tested, you need to be treated, and you need to be followed. And I usually like to follow these patients like three months later to be sure I've corrected their vitamin D deficiency, and then once a year thereafter. Now, you also say in here that the benefits of boosting calcium all the way to weight loss, that even if you don't have enough calcium, that can also get in the way of vitamin D absorption and your levels. Is that correct? Well, what we know is that if you're vitamin D deficient, you can't absorb calcium very efficiently. So normally, if you're vitamin D sufficient, you can absorb about 30 to 40 percent of the calcium that's in your diet. During pregnancy and during lactation and during the growth spurt for children, they can absorb 60 to 80% because of vitamin D helping them to do that. If you're vitamin D deficient, however, you only absorb 10 to 15% of the calcium that is in your diet. And as a result, you can't get enough from your diet. You will go to your bones, which is the uh, major storage form, and you'll take it out therefore increasing your risk for developing osteoporosis later in life, as well as increasing risk for fracture. Talk to us about the vitamin D lamps. Obviously, you're involved in it, you advocate it, and you make it available to people who are interested. Talk about them. Yeah, so there's uh, one lamp that's been sanctioned by the FDA for producing vitamin D. It's called a SPERTI lamp, S-P-E-R-T-I. And you can also find that information on my website and in the book. Um, we've done studies and, uh, working with my colleague, um, down in Emory, um, Dr. Tanpricha showed that, um, children and adults with cystic fibrosis that have a major problem in absorbing vitamin D from supplements or diet when exposed to this lamp could raise their blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. We have study underway right now in patients with fat malabsorption syndromes like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, patients who have had bypass surgery for obesity. Um, A study underway suggests that this lamp can be very effective in raising blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So the lamp is 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 a, a nice way for those that can't absorb vitamin D from supplements, which is what I usually recommend, is a good way for them to be able to make vitamin D and satisfy their body's requirements. And so I typically recommend that you follow the manufacturer's advice and expose like the thighs maybe one day and then wait a day and maybe expose the abdomen the next day and maybe the back so that you're exposing different areas of your body for the period of time that's recommended, which is not sun-burning um, levels, but sub-sun-burning levels, what we call sub erythemal doses. Talk a little bit about the tanning beds, because they're different. What's your advice to the public about them? Sure. 
So first of all, just to be sure, uh, in both my first book and in now The Vitamin D Solution, on basically the first page, I make it clear.